Cross connections are common, even with all the many safety devices and with some knowledge of cross connections, even uh, with the provisions in the city plumbing codes that uh, prohibit the installation of fixtures in such a manner that a cross connection can be established, we still have uh, cross connections occurring at the rate of some 10,000 a day. What is a cross connection? A cross connection is any point in the plumbing system where pollution or contamination could come in contact with the portable water supply. Now there's two types of cross connections. You have the direct cross connection, then you have the indirect cross connection. A direct cross connection is where you would say tie a water line, say directly into a sewer line, by mechanical means, by rigid piping. What I'm going to be showing you today is the indirect type of cross connection. These are the things that you might not have come in contact with or you really haven't thought too much about. And it's the responsibility of, of you gentlemen working at the plumbing trade not to create a cross connection. Hopefully, when I finish this demonstration, you realize what a cross connection is, how it can be created, and how the contaminant or pollution gets into the portable water supply. And we'll do this through the use of our display where we place colored water in these fixtures and appliances, as you see. We place glass mirrors here that's so you can see exactly what happened. A cross connection can be created by back flow and by back siphonage. It can also be created by back flow, back pressure. Contamination or pollution can also enter the portable water supply by a positive or negative pressure. And I'm going to explain the three main ones that you would come in contact with. The most common, back siphonage, backflow and negative pressure. Let me define backflow and back siphonage. I'll use a stick just for an example. If this stick was a piece of pipe and I capped one end of it and I filled that pipe full of water and I elevated it, when I remove the cap, naturally the water would flow to the low point. This would be backflow, nothing more than a difference in elevation. Now, as this water is flowing down the pipe, it is causing a negative pressure, a pressure below atmospheric pressure, which would induce back siphonage. Now, the best protection to eliminate a cross connection is the physical air gap. And I'll use this faucet right here for demonstration. In other words, from your water treatment plant to the city water main, the service line to the building, and the piping within the building, here is the end of the water line. In other words, the outlet of the faucet or pipe. Right here is the end of the sewer line. Now, a lot of persons think that the trap is the end of the sewer line, but the only reason for installing a trap in a fixture is to prevent sewer gas from entering the building. So if there is a backup in the sewer system or there is contamination or pollution in this vessel or this fixture, this would be classed as the end of the sewer line, the overflow rim of the fixture, appliance or device. So you see on this faucet we have separated the water line from the sewer line by a distance of one inch. And this is known as a physical air gap and this is the ultimate in protection. But of course if you have to be underneath pressure then you have to install a recommended approved factory safety device, backflow, back siphonage preventers. The most common used today is the atmospheric vacuum breaker. This is a type of valve where when the water pressure is turned on, it takes the plunger, pushes it up into the closed position. You see, this is cut out to the atmosphere to admit air into the system to prevent any vacuum occurring in the water supply piping. As the water supply is turned off, it takes this diaphragm, pushes it down into the closed position, seals it off, and it automatically admits air into the system. This is the most common use nowadays in plumbing installations. Years back, they would use an ordinary check valve as a backflow, back siphonage device. But as you see, on a common swing check valve, you have to have a good head of water pressure against that diaphragm to make it seat. Of course, it's ground joint. That seat could tend to pit and corrode, and water will bypass right through a check valve. So they found the check valves just were not positive devices. So they're getting more elaborate. 
Because, gentlemen, we have to protect our water supply. They make also different type of valves that can be used underneath constant pressure, such as this type here. Can be used in feed lines to boilers, steam tables, whatever the case might be. It has check valves in it to eliminate backflow, has holes drilled into it to eliminate backsacking. Here's another type that can be used on a hose bib to a laboratory faucet, where you attach a hose to the faucet. This just screws right on. They can attach the hose. It's a positive protection. We get into larger type valves, into the double check assembly type valves. This type of valve here would be used on a low hazard installation, such as there was a possible cross connection within a brewery or let's say a food establishment and something to that respect. In other words, where it would be considered low hazard. This type of valve would be used. It's a double spring-loaded check valve assembly. Now, of course, you'll notice that it does have test cocks on it. This valve does have to be tested periodically because anything mechanical is subject to failure. I have another type valve that would be used if there is high hazard, such as a dye treatment plant, or it could be a plating plant, or a chemical plant where they produce toxic, lethal, poison substance. You notice right here that this valve here is a pressure reducing principal zone type valve. It has a double check valve assembly. This works on a reduction in pressure. In other words, if you have a pressure drop within the system, it activates these double spring-loaded check valves, seals the water from coming in, seals the water from going out. It has an atmospheric vent here. If there is any foulage in the seats, the water would be wasted out the vent. Of course, all valves are designed to be used according to the manufacturer's specifications. You cannot use one valve on all installations. Now, it does take certain conditions for a cross-connection to exist, and I'm going to simulate some conditions as we go along. But I believe before the demonstration is over, you realize it really doesn't take too much of a condition. We have our glass piping here, and I'll just give you a brief outline of what we have here. Here is our portable water coming into our system. We're supplying portable water to these fixtures, appliances, and devices. I have a drain valve down here where I can simulate a water break in the area, or, for example, a fire truck tying onto a fire hydrant. As you know, a fire pumper truck can pull a terrific amount of vacuum. It can suck the city main dry in just a few moments. So I'll use this in this situation, simulating a fire or a water break. You'll notice in the glass mirror here that we have two sprinkler heads, one here and one here. On this sprinkler head, the supply pipe is below ground, control valve below ground. This is an improper installation such as the handyman or the homeowner would install. On the other sprinkler head, the supply pipe is below ground, but we've risen above ground and formed a loop. And in that loop, we've installed a safety device because we have to be underneath pressure. Now, we put this valve in here where we can put this vacuum breaker into operation or take it out of operation to show you the importance to show how it works. Now, let me set up a condition here. Let's say the lady of the house has some plumbing problems. Her kitchen faucet is leaking, so she calls the plumber out to repair the faucet. While she's waiting for the plumber, she wants to irrigate her yard. Now, I'll turn on this valve right here on this one sprinkler head. So the plumber comes out, finds out what the problem is. The first thing he has to do is go out to the easement and shut off the water supply to work on the faucet. So this is what I'll do. I'll shut the supply off. Now, I'm going to put a little bit of food coloring in here to simulate contaminated water because the water that pools around the sprinkler head is not potable water. In fact, it's highly contaminated water. So let's say that the sprinkler system is turned off and the plumber is working on the faucet. Now, let's say at this residence that they have a drinking fountain located in the basement or a lower level. Now, I'm going to use this handle so I can stay out of your way. Let's say the gardener or the small child wants to get a drink of water. So they turn on the drinking fountain. Now, you notice in the glass mirror that the pressure is reduced because the water supply is shut off. But look what's happening. All this contaminated water that is pooled around the sprinkler head is now flowing right down to the drinking fountain. This cross-connection is being created by backflow. Nothing more than a difference in elevation. <coughs> what's up has to come down. So you see, any person drinking out of that fountain now would be drinking highly contaminated water sickness or death could result from this installation. 
On the other zone, we've installed a loop with the vacuum breaker. Our loop should eliminate the back flow from occurring because the loop is higher than the sprinkler head. All right, we'll go through the same procedure. The lady of the house turns on the sprinkler system. I'm taking this vacuum breaker out of operation to show the importance of it. The plumber turns off the water supply and the person gets to drink water out of the fountain. So, the loop should eliminate back flow from occurring, but watch your glass piping here and let's see what happens. You see how this water is being pulled right over the loop? From this portion down, back flow was occurring and back flow induced the back siphonage. A negative pressure below atmospheric pressure. So actually what is happening is atmospheric pressure is pushing on this body of water and forcing it right over the loop. Now you can siphon water 28 feet above sea level. If we were at sea level, you could rise this piping up 28 feet in the air, bring it back down, and you'd still pull the water right over the loop. Now the only way to eliminate siphonage or this vacuum is by emitting air into the system. Now I'm going to put this vacuum breaker into operation and watch the glass piping, and let's see what happens here. You see how it breaks the siphonage? So you see that the water now is seeking its level. No contamination is being pulled back into the system. The vacuum breaker did its job. So in every sprinkler system, you must have the loop. The loop eliminates back flow from occurring, and in every loop, you must have a vacuum breaker to eliminate back siphonage. You have to eliminate both conditions, back flow, back siphonage. Let's go over now to this drinking fountain. We have a vertical stream bubbler drinking fountain. It is a very unsafe fixture because you see that the end of the water line is down below the end of the sewer line. You'll find cigarette butts paper thrown in these fountains and they tend to stop up. It's a very unsanitary fixture because you see that the water supply is also exposed. If a person comes up and gets a drink of water out of that fountain, just one drop of water from their lip would go back into the opening. If this person had a contagious disease, the next person getting a drink could contract that disease. But you see on this fixture, the end of the water line is down below the end of the sewer line. So it basically forms an indirect cross connection. It's not connected directly to the sewer system, but it is indirectly. Here is a modern type drinking fountain. You probably cannot notice it in the glass mirror, but the outlet of the water supply is up at this level. So you see, we've provided the air gap. Also, the manufacturers has incorporated an opening even lower to separate the water line from the sewer line. So it is considered to be a relatively safe fixture in that respect. You notice that it has a hood on it where it would take contortionists to get his head around, to get his mouth on the bubbler. So you see, it's much better protected than this bubbler where a person could put their mouth to it. We'll go over now to this lavatory. We have two different faucets. We have the faucet where we have provided the air gap. On the other faucet, the end of the water line is down below source of contamination. Now we place the stopper in here to simulate a backup in the sewer system. Let's say the water supply is turned on. This is a very good example of the reason for an air gap. Now let's say there is a water break in the neighborhood or a fire in the neighborhood a fire truck tying onto a fire hydrant. Let's see what happens here. Watch your glass piping. You see how it is pulling the contaminant right back into our portable water supply. You hear that sucking effect? You see, we're continuing to pull that water up. We are creating a negative pressure within the supply piping. So you see, we have pulled that up approximately almost half an inch. I can't create too much of a vacuum here because we only have about an 18 inch drop. But if we had a large city break, this could pull it up, say, five-eighths to three-quarters of an inch. So never less, gentlemen, than a one-inch air gap. Your air gap is determined by the effective opening of your outlet. If you have a half-inch outlet on your water supply, you must have a one-inch air gap. If you have a two-inch outlet on the water supply, you must have a four-inch air gap. In other words, double the effective opening of your outlet. We'll go over now to this kitchen sink. Normally this faucet would be placed on the back wall, but we've placed it here so you can see exactly what's happening. What I have done, I have attached a spray hose, and you can buy these in any five and 10 cent store. They make it for kitchen sink, hose connections, or the filler on your bathtub. 
Anytime you attach a hose to a faucet, what you're doing is actually extending the end of the water line. I'm going to simulate a water break, and I think I have enough coloring in there that you will be able to see exactly what happens. Gentlemen, this is basically like siphoning gas out of an automobile, out of the tank. What we're going to do is siphon the liquid, the pollutant, or the contamination within that vessel. You see how we're pulling it back in to our portable water supply. And gentlemen, this will continue to siphon the contents of that vessel until the water level gets down below the end of the hose where we admit air into the system to break the partial vacuum created in the system. Let's go upstairs now and I'll explain the cooling tower. This would be normally found on a commercial building. There are still a lot of them in existence. You notice in this cooling tower that we have a float assembly. It's nothing more than a float valve that regulates the height of the water. Now we have bent the float rod on that valve to rise the level of the water. And you will find that 99% of these cooling towers overflowing because the float rod gets bent. Now the water within that cooling tower, that substance, is not considered to be portable water. In fact, it's highly contaminated water. Have you ever seen the inside of a cooling tower? You'll find dead birds, roaches, rats, tadpole, lime, scum, fungus acid in these cooling towers. So that water in that vessel is not considered to be portable water. Now, as I said, it takes certain conditions for a cross connection to exist. On the sprinkler system, the lady of the house had to turn on the sprinkler system. The plumber had to come out, work on the faucet. The water supply had to be shut off and the person had to get a drink of water out of a fixture at a lower level or an opening. But I'm going to just turn on this lavatory faucet right here and let's see if anything happens. Now this is with the water supply on. This is with, all, with the pressure within the building. Watch the glass piping and let's see if anything happens here. You see how that contamination is being pulled right back into the portable water supply. This cross connection is being created by a negative pressure within the supply piping. Because gentlemen, anytime you open up a faucet, you are going to reduce the pressure in the system. You don't see this out in the field, you don't see it out on the job. But gentlemen, it's just as simple as that. The correct installation would be to plug up that opening, take the supply pipe, run it up to the side, put a nipple in, put the float valve assembly inside the tank, maintain the physical air gap. You just need a longer float rod is all you need. Because gentlemen, that is the ultimate. That is your best protection, the physical air gap. Anytime you can install a physical air gap, do so. It is the best protection. Let's go over now to our water closets. We have a cutaway of the bowl and we have a cutaway of the tank. As you gentlemen realize, when you flush your water closet, the water passes through the flush valve assembly where the main portion of the water waste into the bowl, into this area here. In this channel, there is a jet known as a siphon jet. This starts the siphonic action. This is what siphons the contents of the bowl, liquid and solid. When it finishes its siphonic action, you notice that the water level in the bowl stays low, basically right along in here. This red ribbon indicates the seal of the trap. From the crown wear of the trap to the dip of the trap, this is your water seal. And all traps must have a minimum of a two inch water seal, never less. They have found that a body of water one inch is sufficient. Sewer gas will not penetrate a body of water one inch or more. So you see, if the water level stays low, basically in this area, you would not have your one inch water seal. So let's see what brings the water back up into the bowl. On the cutaway of our tank, our ball cock. As the water passes through the ball cock assembly, a portion of it passes through the hush tube, the remaining portion passes through the refill tube, which wastes into the overflow tube, which wastes into the bowl to fill the seal back up. But this little tube serves another very important purpose because here is the end of the water line, here is the end of the sewer line. Now they have made smear tests of sidewalls of toilet tanks and found them to be highly contaminated. For an example, every time you flush your water closet, 
as it finishes its siphonic action, there'll be a small amount of sewer gas that will be brought back into the bowl. And the overflow tube acts just like a chimney. It pulls that bacteria, the germs, spreads it over the body of water. Also, if the homeowner has a stoppage in their water closet, they take an old-type plumber's friend, every time they give it a pump, they'll pump raw sewage right back up into the tank. So, gentlemen, it's important that this little tube here be placed in the overflow tube where it can get air. It should never be brought out to the side, pushed down into the water, crimped off, or plugged. Because, gentlemen, this is your vacuum breaker. As we all know, the float rod in a toilet tank is very easily bent. But let's give the homeowner a break this time and assume the toddy bowl man has an accident. Gentlemen, when this float rod is bent, it prevents the ball cock assembly from seating properly. This means that the water is running continuously out of the refill tube. If a break in the water line occurs, creating negative pressure, the air gap at the end of the refill tube will prevent back siphonage of the tank. However, if that tube were to be submerged in the tank water, back siphonage would suck the water into the portable water supply until the water level was reduced to the point of being below the refill tube. Upstairs, we have placed flushometer valves on the two water closets. One of these flushometer valves is equipped with a vacuum breaker. You notice that the red ribbon leading up to the funnel device? That is your vacuum breaker. Because you see, the end of the water line enters the bowl right here. It meets the sewer line. On these water closets, it's a built-in indirect cross connection, so we do have to protect the water supply. You notice on the other vachometer valve, we do not have the vacuum breaker installed. The reason we have hooked them up as such is to show you. You can hook up a flushometer valve with or without a vacuum breaker, and it'll work just fine. No problems in operation. When you flip the handle on the flushometer valve, there's a round diaphragm inside. Water pressure opens up that diaphragm and passes the water on through. There's an equalizing port inside that valve, and when so many gallons of water passes through, water pressure takes that diaphragm and pushes it up into the closed position. In other words, you have to have pressure against it, just like the swing check I showed you a few minutes ago. Now, I'm going to turn on the water supply to this water closet, and we have stopped up the drain, simulating a stoppage. And as you know, if there is a stoppage in the sewer system, the water closet is going to overflow. It's one of the basically lower type fixtures on a plumbing system. Now, we'll let that fill up to the point of overflow, and what I will do is simulate a water break. Now watch the glass piping and let's see how much contamination we pull back into our system here. You hear that sucking effect? You see, we protected the water supply by the installation of a vacuum breaker. Now we'll fill up the system again here and we'll go over to our other flushometer valve that is not equipped with the vacuum breaker and we'll go through the same procedure. Gentlemen, this has been done in many, many installations. Years back, these flushometer valves did not come equipped with vacuum breakers. But in just a few moments, I'm going to show you the hazards, and I guarantee you'll never install a flushometer valve without a vacuum breaker. Now, let's see what happens here. Let me simulate just a small water break. I'm only simulating a one-inch break right here. Gentlemen, that is nothing more than raw sewage. To me, I know of no worse fixture than the flushometer valve without a vacuum breaker installed on it. To me, it is the most hazardous. Let's go over now to our meter box. In this meter box, we've installed a stop and waste valve. These were used many years back for pier and beam installations. In other words, where the water pipe was exposed underneath the house. So if there was a hard freeze coming, the homeowner could turn off the water supply. Let me shut off this drain valve right here. And I'm going to speed up the action a little bit. If there is a hard freeze coming, the homeowner turns off the water supply to drain the water within the pipe to keep the pipe from freezing. You notice in this valve, there's an opening in the side. So you see, the water piping within the building is now draining back to the meter box. And of course, it'll fill up this meter box to the point of overflow. Have you gentlemen ever lifted up the lid of a meter box? That's pretty raunchy, stagnant water, isn't it? It's not considered to be potable water. And of course, as I said, it'll fill it up to the point of overflow. Now, I'm going to drain the system right here. And let's see what happens. Watch your glass piping here. I'll drain it down just a little bit right here. So you see, all this contaminated liquid within this box is now flowing back into the service line to the building. 
until it seeks level. And then when the homeowner turns on their water supply, they distribute that contaminated liquid throughout the entire system. Let's cover another area. You'll find that modern codes do not allow a water line and a sewer line in the same ditch. And this is what we are demonstrating here. We have used plastic pipe and we have a joint in our ditch. We've made a bad joint here and we've also installed a piece of pipe in here. This is plastic pipe. It could either be galvanized, could be copper, PVC or CPVC installed. Now we've developed a little pinhole in this piping because you gentlemen have probably noticed out on the job that your ditch is generally the catch-all for the materials used on construction, such as rocks, boards with nails in it, the whole works. So if the ditch is not cleaned out properly and there is debris, a pinhole could de be developed either through an improper joint or the pipe moving in the ditch through expansion and contraction. And as you know, material does move, could develop a pinhole in it. So we have made a bad joint. We've developed a pinhole in this. So you see how the water is passing out. Now we have connected the water line to this faucet right <coughs> over here. And it'll take just a few seconds to submerge that inlet. But I think this will give you a basic idea of exactly what can happen here. As I said, it takes conditions for cross connections to exist. So I'm going to turn on this faucet right here and let's see what happens. Let's say the homeowner is getting a drink of water out of a faucet. And let's say the next door neighbor is washing his car or there's a reduction in pressure. So I'm going to cut the water supply down here just a little bit, the flow down. Let's see if anything happens here. As I said, it does take conditions. Actually, what is happening as the water is passing through this little pinhole, it is aspirating this sewage right back into the portable water supply. The sewer line could be partially stopped up. This gentleman you don't see, the homeowner doesn't see. So it's important in your plumbing that you install your material according to the manufacturer's specification. We have good materials in the markets today, but they must be installed properly. So gentlemen, you see that behooves you to follow your codes, which are very important, and to follow the manufacturer's specification on your installation. Gentlemen, ironically, the most common cross-connection is an ordinary garden hose, a silcock, because any time you attach a hose to a faucet, you're extending the end of the water line. So if your hose is placed in the ditch, a ditch or a flower bed or a bucket of substance of unknown quality, if the water supply is turned on, the same thing will happen as I've demonstrated on my kitchen sink faucet here. Also, if the hose is placed on the side of the hill, back flow could occur, as well as the back siphonage could occur. Modern code now is requiring that all hose connections be equipped with a back flow, back siphonage preventer. And here's one that we've attached. It has holes drilled into it to eliminate back siphonage and has a spring-loaded check valve to eliminate back flow. Back flow, back siphonage, and negative pressure is created every day in plumbing system. There's over 10,000 cross connections being created every day within the state of Texas alone. And the survey has run where there's over 100,000 in the United States. So you can imagine that every opening from the water supply has to be protected. I'm Bill Wheeler, Chief Plumbing Inspector of the City of Victoria, and this is Milton Belleville, Chief Plumbing Inspector of the City of Houston. Cross connections are a common occurrence due primarily to the misunderstanding and misapplication of materials by the plumber. One specific instant that comes to mind is in the installation of the lawn sprinkler system. A vacuum breaker must be installed at, on each zone. We've had occasions where one vacuum breaker was installed for the entire system. And Bill, <clears throat> the reason we're here today in this court is uh, due to a situation that I ran across it uh, involved an apartment project uh, where they use the little uh, blue things that hang in a toilet tank, supposedly to clean the toilet tank and the bowl. And <clears throat> the vacuum breakers on, on the ball cocks were b below the water level. And uh, they got a negative pressure on the main and sucked all of this blue dye back into the fresh uh, portable water 
and drinking water. Plumbers certainly have a moral as well as a legal responsibility to the general public for seeing that a safe job is installed and the provisions of the city plumbing code are followed. The city plumbing inspector will make a final inspection and if all of this is done, there should be no cross connections in a plumbing installation.